Well, good morning, everyone. It's really great to be with you. Uh, I, uh, I'm so impressed. 41 states, four provinces, and, and New Zealand. I've got to be in New Zealand once for a couple weeks. It's a beautiful place in England. So welcome, everybody, to South Dakota. I echo, echo that very sincerely. Uh, we have a beautiful state. I didn't get to go on the tours yesterday. I, I wish I had. It looked... Um, it, it rained, and um, I'm from the eastern part of the state, back in the corn soybean country, and it's hard for me to tell you the truth uh, daily. So it's great to be out here in uh, grass country and in beautiful Black Hills. Uh, so I hope you had a great tours yesterday. I'm sure you did. I know a lot of the people who uh, visited most of the ranches that you visited over my long life now, and uh, I'm sure you had a great time. The uh, I will say that, that today's, uh, my speech is going to have a South Dakota influence, and I, I'm, I don't apologize for this, for that. I, I love this state about as much as Kate does, I think, and uh, uh, I certainly love uh, western South Dakota and the, grass, the grassland ecosystem that we have and the, uh, the animal industries that's been built on that. So um, Jim set, told you a little bit about myself, and. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more because I, I think my comments need to be in context of um, this rich life I've, I've been privileged to live. Um, I, uh, my family's ranch was about um, 70 miles south of the ranch that, that you saw in that movie. Um, Kate and I are actually distant relatives and I'm very proud of that too. And uh, the, uh, So that's a picture of the ranch, my family's ranch, and where I spent a good good part of my life. Uh, if there, other than a couple cottonwoods, if there was a tree on the place, it was planted, and uh, that made ranching hard sometimes in, in, during the winter. Um, my grandfather um, used, to, uh, used to say that he would, so we're relatives with Danny, and, and, his, and Dan's dad was Ski Rasmussen, and my grandfather were uh, relatives and good friends, and so my dad, my, my grandfather said he would trade a cedar, uh, a cedar draw for a, a sand hill any day of the, of the week, Danny. So, uh, but we had very open country, beautiful grassland, tall grass prairie on the Rosebud Indian Reservation, or mid-grass prairie on the, on the Rosebud. And uh, was in my family a long time, and uh, had a wonderful time there. I got to, to ranch there nearly 20 years, and uh, as an adult, I uh, spent a lot of my childhood there with my grandparents, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, my parents both passed away kind of tragically at the same time, had a family corporation, and, and uh, after my parents died, uh, cousins and brothers and sisters all wanted to, to, uh, to break up the ranch and get, get their resources out of it. So we sold that ranch, and I had to reinvent myself, and I went back and I got a Ph.D., and and started a career on the faculty at SDSU and taught there, and uh, it was teaching was a wonderful experience too. Um, can't believe that I'm the 20th president, 20th president of my alma mater, and any of there aren't very many of you who would have been at SDSU when I was there. Danny was, uh, but uh, I'm sure as he's surprised and shocked that I'm the president <laughs> based upon 1971 behavior as. Uh, as I am, but it's really, really uh, a great experience. I love it. I, lo I love the young people, um, 12,500 of the nicest kids in the whole wide world. So it's, it's a real privilege for me to serve that role. But as Jim said, uh, so um, this, is, uh, this really will have a South Dakota influence today. This is a painting from about um, 1950 uh, by one of the, our state's most famous painters, artists, uh, Oscar Howe, and it's called Dakota Teaching. Uh, Oscar was a Dakota, uh, Yankton Sioux Dakota I Indian, and he was a tremendous artist. And that's called Dakota Teacher. And uh, so today, for a little bit, I'm that gray-haired gray gray old man teaching. But um, I need to give a shout out to a whole bunch of people who I was the pupil of and I learned from. And so I don't know if some of these people I hope are here. Dave Stephan, Ralph Cole isn't here because he was an NRCS uh, soil conserva or range conservationist, just an incredible individual. Dwayne Breyer, Jim Johnson, Dan O'Brien, who I hope is here. I hope you had a great tour of Dan's place yesterday. Jim Falstick, uh, Phil Baird is one of the speakers today, a good friend. Uh, Nina Teicholz, I read her book and heard her speak. Uh, Ski Rasmussen that I mentioned, uh, Kate's grandpa. Uh, 
Lyle Perman's here, an old friend from a long time ago. Jonathan Lundgren taught, uh, was at the USA, USDA station. I've read a lot of Jonathan's work, and he's speaking today. Jim Falstick, of course. Fred um, Kirschman, I've uh, read and I'm, read your work and listened to you, for, and I was in the audience, and you didn't even know I was there, but you influenced my life and, uh, and learned a lot from you. Burke Teichert's here. I, I, took, I went to savory courses in the 1980s and uh, met Alan Savory several times. Um, and just, so there's a long litany of, of teachers for me, and now I'm, I am kind of humbled to be in front of you as a teacher today. So, but that's the role I'm going to play. As, um, so the comments that I make are gonna be framed around my experience as a cattle rancher, as a teacher, as a academic. I've, I've published a lot about grassland uh, and um, the, the the terrible disturbance that we had and the loss of the prairie that Kate mentioned um, over the last 10 years when I was dean. I kept publishing with, with good work from harder worker fa hard, hard working faculty at SDSU. And, uh, uh, but really, uh, one of the key points of my life that will shape some of the comments, that really shape some of the comments that I'm going to have for you this morning was the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management that I, that I started. In, it, in t with Texas A&M and um, with the King Ranch in, in South Texas. And that was a wonderful experience, six and a half years, hard to go, hard to leave South Dakota, uh, nice to come back, but in the interim, I got to see, just because of the way we ran the program, I got to see some of the most beautiful, um, interesting uh, ranches, farms, large agricultural operations, and, and small in the United States. I saw large operations uh, in Pennsylvania, in California, Washington, Oregon, uh, Florida, uh, all the Great Plains, up and down the Great Plains, and most of the Rocky Mountain states. Uh, ranches like the Hoodoo and the Padlock and Vermeo Park and, and King Ranch, of course, and the Armstrong Ranch, just four sixes, these great famous old ranches that um, played such an enormous history. But also some large uh, ag operations, large sod operations, citrus, cotton. Uh, I saw an operation in the state of Washington that had six, a single operation had 680 center pivots and uh, raised, did, and raised food. Uh, that was shipped in unit car trains to the East Coast, and they raised green beans and, and corn for human beings, wheat, potatoes, and several other uh, crops in a very complex rotation, but 680 center pivots in one operation. And, uh, and so all of that, and I've, I've watched agricultural evolve, agricultural evolve in, in my lifetime, and um, um, so that's all gonna, kind of shape my comments today, plus all those people that I learned from. I'll tell you a story of unbelievable productivity. So as a, a, a child on a cattle ranch in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, ca uh, weaning weights, uh, no crossbreeding, uh, of course no growth implants, uh, didn't even own a horse trailer, uh, everything was on horseback. Um, uh, Weaning weights, uh, 300 and some pounds, had to run the calves over uh, just to get them uh, as, and sold them as yearlings, just to get them uh, big enough to sell. Um, and, and today, uh, weaning weights of lots and lots of cattle in the United States, depending on the age and when the time of calving, et cetera. But you know, 600 pound weaning weights are common. And, and uh, so, you know, really doubled cattle production. Reproductive rates have soared um, over in, in this, um, during this uh, 60 some, 60 plus years of my life. Uh, so it's, it's just an enormous difference in cattle production. My, my grandfather with his 300 pound calves and his eight or 900 pound yearlings was very profitable for the time he ranched. Um, but that was a, a, a model that if, if uh, 300 pound calves uh, in most systems in the United States today would not be acceptable and, uh, and, and it's just and for lots of reasons. When Jane and I moved to Brookings, South Dakota and bought the farm that we have now, um, which is now mostly grass, um, uh, the average corn yield in Brookings, South Dakota, which is on the eastern part of our state, was 86 bushels. The county average, ASCS average, was 86 bushels per acre. It's now nearly double that. 
just incredible productivity for all kinds of reasons. Uh, genetics and nitrogen fertilizer and tillage systems and on and on. But, but, but it's just hard to believe that in a 20 year period, 22 year period, that you could double productivity like that. And, and wheat used to be a major crop in South Dakota and wheat yields now um, are, are what corn yields used to be. And might not make it this year, we had some pretty tough, a challenging spring. But spring wheat yields of 70 bushels, winter wheat of 80, 90 bushels you hear about. Just incredible change in productivity. When, um, and, and in, in western part of South Dakota in the 1950s, 1960s into the 1970s, only half of every acre was farmed every year because the other half was, was fallowed trying to save uh, moisture, which now is, um, you know, talk about coming full circle. So we're, har we're, we're farming twice as much land. There's only a few acres of fallow left, thank goodness. And, uh, and the productivity is just enormous. And so, and, and agriculture is, as I mentioned in my travels around the United States with the King Ranch Institute students, um, just extremely diverse. And, and, and I go back to, uh, going to be an undergraduate at South Dakota State many years ago, I can tell you that as, as I travel the United States now and meet alums from the 1960s and 1970s when I was there um, in, in Arizona or Texas or, or California or wherever they settled, uh, they were engineers, they were pharmacists, they left South Dakota and, and uh, every one of them, every one of them will say the moment I left um, Dad shipped the livestock because the the family the uh, this these sons and daughters did all the you know did all those heavy chores on on wean, on farrowing sows and weaning pigs all by hand and uh, feeding cattle everything by hand and as soon as they left uh, the story is Dad sold the livestock and turned it into a grain farm so again enormous change and that picture of that Cisco truck and I I I. Th think the food system is so complex and that truck is a huge part of it. So I'm in Eagle Butte, South Dakota uh, on the Cheyenne River Reservation, um, which is probably a million and a half acres of grassland and farmland. And um, Cisco, this you know, Fortune 500 company, is delivering the food to Eagle Butte, South Dakota to the, to the Cheyenne River people of the uh, Cheyenne River uh, Indian reservation. So um, I was shocked, so I ran down the truck and took a picture of the truck. Uh, that's not a local food system, is it? Um, and, and they have an enormous impact on our lives. I, I, it, when you dig into this just a little bit, and I, I know this sounds kind of silly, but if, if, you, if you haven't noticed, every scone we eat today, whether it's at a Starbucks or, or at a restaurant in, in Eagle Butte, is about the same. And it's because they're all part of a food system that Cisco and other big companies make all the scones and then deliver them out and somebody bakes them for a few minutes and in an oven and then we eat the same scone and that's a true story. There's very few people who actually make the, uh, most of the food we consume. So when I was born, about 15% of the nation's population, of the America, U.S. population, lived on farms. And today it's less than 2%, way less than 2%. Well, if you do the math, that's over 50 million people aren't farming that would be farming if we used the same methods of 1950. And so that human potential has expressed itself now in driverless cars and autonomous vehicles of all types. I think semis will be the first one probably, or some farm vehicles. In, in, in cell phones that everybody turned off, but can connect you to any place in the world. And with Wikipedia, you can learn everything you need to know right, at, right in the palm of your hand. An unbelievable explosion of information and knowledge and understanding. And it's been, it's been made possible because we're not all raising all of our own food every day. And on the medical side, I'm sure that everyone in this room has a tragic story of a, of a relative who's passed away from, from disease or 
an accident and every one of us also has a miraculous story of, of what modern medicine has done to save a family, maybe your life or someone in your family's life. And we have new hips and new shoulders and new, new knees and as soon as we get to Medicare, right? Uh, and that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> some of you are too young to know that. but. Uh, and, and we uh, just incredible health uh, that, that we have. So my, I, my, lo my life expectancy, and, and I, I just about got dizzy looking at, at um, tables last night, making sure I was about right on this. So just on, on uh, just summarizing it, my life expectancy is about 10 years longer than my father's was. And my son's is about, and my two boys, my two young men, I was about 10 years longer than mine. And that's because of this enormous creativity and ingenuity and, and uh, improvement in healthcare. And it's a great thing. And we've all benefited. I know everyone in this room has benefited in some way or another. Babies that wouldn't have survived have survived. And people are surviving, young women are surviving breast cancer that never would have survived 20, 25 years ago and on and on and on. And, and there's an improved quality of life, an increased, and I mentioned the longevity. So when I was born, my parents were devoting 25 on, this is national st statistics, 25% of their disposable income for food. And you and I are spending less than 10%. And that differential makes that um, skidoo, whatever that watercraft is, I, that's not me on that, that's not a picture of me, I can tell you. And, and camping has become not a, a, a tent or a sleeping bag under the stars, but, but that fifth wheel trailer. And that's not just for retired people, that's going camping in a state park in South Dakota today. And so that, that enormous shift in the amount of resources that we have to devote to something other than food has, has gone, a lot of it's gone to leisure, to Netflix and all these crazy things in the world we live in. And in Minneapolis, Minnesota, they build a billion dollar football stadium. And that, that stadium that you see was nearly that, just to play baseball uh, 60 games a, t a year. So Peter Dupree, I don't have a picture of him. He was a Native American man on the Cheyenne River Reservation in the 1800s. And in the 1880s, he saved some bison. And he passed away and, sold, and his heirs sold his, this small group that turned out to be about 80 bison to Scotty Phillips. And that's the guy with the, that cowboy hat that Phillips, South Dakota is named after. And Scotty Phillips, on his own, fenced his own land and helped save an endangered species from extinct, extinction. I've never done that. I've never taken all my own money and tried to save a species. But Scotty did, and before him, Pete did the hard work because he, he was actually saving calves and building, hiding a herd um, uh, hiding it so no one would, would bother it as they tried to wipe out the, the, as we tried to wipe out that beautiful species. And there were only a few others. Charlie Goodnight in Texas, a family up in, in uh, Montana, and the herd at Yellowstone. It's, an, um, it's a marvelous story. But three of the players of that story were private land owners who did it through a conservation ethic. That, so if I can go back ethics. They had a conservation ethic. Something was bigger than them. And they saved the bison. And that herd created the herd at Custer State Park and, and uh, it's just a great success story. The other person up there is Peter Norbeck. Peter Norbeck was a governor of South Dakota and he was a three-time senator and as a governor, he, he created and built the largest state park in the United States. In a state with only a few hundred thousand people, it's Custer State Park, it's an absolute treasure, it's an absolute gem, and Peter Norbeck, as a policymaker, as a governor, had the courage and foresight to do that for us. And it took, 
back to leadership, entrepreneurship. How did he do it? How did he pay for it? How did, how did um, Scotty Phillips fence thousands of acres to run his bison? And the story is, that's in all the books about Scotty Phillips is, that when he died, he, was, he died relatively young, and he was buried on his ranch in the bison pasture. And on the day of his funeral, this is now several hundred bison, on the day of his funeral, during the funeral, the bison came to the funeral. They came over the hills to the funeral. It's a beautiful story, and, and the more we tell it, the more true it probably is. But it's a great story. So early settlers called them the Black Hills because when you got about 80 miles east of here, you started seeing these Black Hills. And uh, you still can. The air's good enough, I guess. And, and so you say, well, what's the Lakota word for Black Hills? And it's Pahasapa. And that's pretty easy. Well, that's Black Hills. That's what we called it. We, that's what we call them. But the, the Lakota word, which I can't pronounce, means the heart of everything that is. And when you're up there, you'll understand it, because it's spectacular. Beautiful meadows, rugged granite outcroppings, just a beautiful, beautiful place. And it was very, very special to them, and why, after all these years, they still um, refuse to, to sell the Black Hills. Ivan Doig, uh, he called Montana this house of sky. What a beautiful name for Montana. I know a lot of people from Montana are here today and you've got to agree, it's all sky. And yet those mountains out there are just waiting for you and it's really spectacular in Montana. And um, so what, what is our name for this beautiful country that's on that picture? Ecosystem is kind of, you know, cold and, you know, Kate challenged us to save these ecosystems. It's got to be more than that. There's some spiritual part of this whole story that has to be part of this, or I think we're lost. So I challenge you, as you, as you listen to the other speakers, and you have great speakers today, and uh, to think about what, what we should name this place, this, these grasslands that we love. Thank you so much for listening to me this morning and your patience, and thanks for being here, thanks for caring, thanks for having the courage and the leadership, the entrepreneurship, and the absolute guts to fight this fight for grass, agriculture, and sustainability. Thank you very much.